So we're still reading from uh, the letter to the Hebrews. Our first readings from, from all of this week uh, have been from the letter to the Hebrews, which we have been uh, reflecting on as regards the priesthood. Uh, it speaks quite a lot about the priesthood, the priesthood of Jesus Christ, and uh, as such is a wonderful teaching also to priests of the New Covenant. And uh, a very high bar indeed is set for us, which is good, which is good. And one of our community members yesterday, uh, she had surgery. Uh, she had surgery done on, in, on, her, on her head, so brain surgery effectively. And it's just, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine what it must be like for surgeons, right? Just, I don't want to be too gory now or anything, but like, you get a, bl a really sharp blade in your hand. It's quite strategically now. You stick it, you just... You just, you just cut someone open, right? And you, you peel back the skin, you peel back the muscle. There might be an old bone there. If the bone's in the way, you get a little bit of a grinder, effectively. All stainless steel. You cut it out of the way, all right? And we'll weld that back later on. Uh, and uh, then he, there are all the organs pumping away and doing their thing inside. Oh, there was the liver. Obviously, obviously that's, not, that's, not what the surgery, that's not what the surgeon yesterday saw, otherwise... <laughs> I think we're starting at the wrong end. <laughs> but, but in general, like, you cut someone, and then, like, here are all these bits and pieces working inside, okay? And you have to know how to get around the good organs and find the, the bad organ, not necessarily take out the bad organ, but take out the bad part of what should be a good organ or remove part of a lung or remove part of a liver. My goodness, like, and it's an artery there. If I, if I nick that, the person's going to bleed to death. If I just, if I, a little nick at all, they will bleed out and we can, you know, there's nothing you can do. Just the responsibility of it is absolutely, obviously that's why they get paid uh, quite a bit. But, but like the responsibility behind doing something like this, you know, is, is, is phenomenal, phenomenal. Like, especially brain surgery, there's just no margin for error, you know. Uh, and yet, yet they do it. People do it. People sign up for this. People go to college, they, they, they study, and then they begin what's called uh, a practice. I think is the most awful word for, I have a medical practice. Who wants to be first? <laughs> when you think about it. But they, you know, they do this, and they do, it, they do it well, and they are, if you will, like applauded for it. You know, when, when a surgeon does his job well, I mean, like, uh, it's something we, just, we simply couldn't do. We just wouldn't know where to start. We'd know where to start. <laughs> we wouldn't know what to do after we've got the person open. All right? So like, you just, we, we do applaud people for excelling in this kind of, of, of business, if you want to call it that, in this kind of job, in this kind of vocation. You know, if, if a surgeon is good, you actually get a reputation. You get a reputation of being competent and, you know, having the, even a, a veterinary surgeon, a friend of mine, he said, you know, amongst vets, I presume it's the same amongst human surgeons as well, uh, you always try to make the smallest incision possible. You try, to, you try to cut as little skin as possible to try and make the wound as small as possible so that the healing is as quick as possible. But obviously the smaller the incision, now the smaller the room you have to work inside. But it's, it's kind of a, I suppose, a veterinary thing, a mark of excellence. If you can have the smallest incision possible, uh, it makes you a better, a better surgeon. Okay, so we, and we applaud excellence in this field. And I think we're right to applaud excellence in this field. It's, it's good that we have good surgeons. This is a good thing. Okay. When we think about the priesthood, what's, what I find very, very interesting about the priesthood is we will very often be applauded for not being a good priest. Right? Uh, the things, we can do certain things as a priest that aren't good, that will make us popular. Really interesting. It's kind of the opposite to many other jobs. I mean, even a bricklayer, right? If a bricklayer can't lay a wall that's straight or parallel, if it's a, a bit of a tip, and if it's not pointed off properly, you'll see it. And you go, gee, I'm not getting him again. And then when your neighbor asks, yeah, I have, I have a wall to, to, to get done, who do you recommend? Not Tommy Flynn anyway. Don't go near him. The guy who wouldn't know how to lay, he wouldn't know how to build Lego, right? You know, like, you know, so like, we, we, when we see someone not doing their job right, it's ridiculous. But a priest, right? If, if a priest lives his vocation superficially, he'll actually often be applauded for, applauded for it. It's the opposite of what it should be. So if, if a priest like, is calling people on to, to holiness, uh, Jane, you know, Father, come on, come on, Arlette. Jane, should we go to Mass? Sure, look, I haven't killed anyone. 
uh, if a priest is talking about like deepening our prayer lives or c- conversion, uh, often the reaction will be, you know, that makes us feel uncomfortable. And we don't like to be made to feel uncomfortable. Okay, we were, we were doing fine under Father Ryan, and then you came along with all of your fandangled ideas of holiness. You know, when you're putting on adoration, you're genie lads, sure look at you know, and, and as, as you try to raise the bar at all, and not to make people feel bad, but to draw people to the Lord, the way, the truth, and the life, their ultimate salvation, their ultimate happiness, you try to raise the bar at all. And it can actually often be met with resistance rather than, maybe this is what God is calling us to, rather than recognizing maybe this is how God is choosing to lead us now. So if I celebrate Mass really quickly, if I never preach at all, ever, uh, if I have loads of time to be spending with all sorts of clubs and societies and I go to all the local club hurling and football matches and uh, I know everyone, I can walk down the street and there's Bridie and Timmy and Jenny and Mary, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if I have time for everything and everyone, but never do a holy hour, I'll be applauded. I'll be applauded. If my mass is lightning fast, I'll be applauded. If I never preach, I'll be applauded. If I, if I never say anything that makes people feel uncomfortable, I'll be applauded. And at the same time, I will, in time, empty the church. Because young people are never inspired by mediocrity. Young people are never inspired by mediocrity. And while they'll say, yeah, yeah, he was sound, he was sound, they won't go to Mass. You know, they won't go to him if they have a spiritual need. Because he never showed himself to be a spiritual leader. Why would they? So it's, 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 an, it's an interesting situation we priests find ourselves in that we can be popular for the wrong reasons and unpopular without good reason. It's, uh, I think that's probably because our field, what we do, what we deal with, if we're honest, it, it does affect people's lives, their hobbits, <laughs> hobbies and habits, genie. <laughs> hobbies and habits. It affects what you do with your free time. <laughs> okay? It affects your life in a way that a, surgery, a surgeon doesn't. Right? Uh, if, 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 uh, if you go to listen to a, a preacher or a teacher, a homily, and it says, look, I mean, doing this with your free time, spending all of your free time watching matches or going to games all the time when you have no time for your kids... This isn't the call of a father. That might make me feel uncomfortable as a father. So maybe I'd rather go to a mass where there's, where there's no homily, no preaching, no teaching. And uh, how many that, 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 how many that just, just tells me I'm fine. We're all going to heaven. It's grand. Once you haven't killed anyone you, and you recycle, you're good to go. That's easy. But it's not the call of the Lord. So why did people cram almost to crushing point to see Jesus? Was it because he made them feel comfortable? No, because he didn't. He didn't make people necessarily feel comfortable. What he said often was very, very challenging. But people came. Now, people would have come, I suppose, for his preaching and his teaching, and I suppose the way he would have said it. He could, challenge, he could be challenging, but in a way that was so loving that you didn't feel beaten down. You felt, you felt capable. You know, I mean, I'm here. He's talking about being here. But I feel that I can, I, can actually, I can get there. I can. If I rely on God, if I pray, if I, if I try, if I start this process, maybe I, I, can, I can actually get to this point of sanctity and selflessness. I remember a couple of years ago, I was um, talking to a man who, who described that he was having a, an affair with his secretary. And... Uh, He's married with, with uh, he had two children at the time. And it's, it's not necessarily very like me. And this was initially, by the way, so you can get away with it a little more. But uh, I had to eat him out of it. <laughs> I don't do this very often. But I had to actually eat him. I said, have you any idea what you're doing? Have you any idea that you will lose the respect of your wife? You will probably lose the respect of your children. Your marriage will fall apart. And you risk your eternal salvation. For what? Ten minutes of pleasure. Is that it? Is that it? Like, is this actually what you're weighing up and losing? 
Are you crazy? Because he's a beautiful family, absolutely beautiful family. I ate him out of it. And it worked. <laughs> it worked. I mean, he came back to me a couple of months later, uh, with, you know, with his wife and his kids, and he just gave me, it was, just, it, was, it, was a, it was a man thing, he just gave me the, and I said, <laughs> that was it. Do you know, it was just, like, he, that's, that's what he actually needed, a good kick in the pants, like, to, to wake up and realize what I'm actually risking by doing this, you know? I would imagine all of us uh, from our, our school years, we can remember the teacher who affirmed us, the teacher who maybe challenged us, maybe the teacher who even failed us, but told us that you are capable, I know you can do better, I know you can do more. Is there anything I can do to help? What do you need? Is, is there something you don't understand? The teacher who, who gave us extra time, sat us down, helped us through the thing, kept the bar high, kept the bar high, but helped us achieve it. And then when we did, gave us that pat on the back, gold star, the A, whatever it was, the A grade, or if there's a male teacher, the, the bottom jaw. Uh, and and uh, we, we would remember those teachers. I mean, I think if you, if you, if all of you now sitting there, if, if you take a second to think about it, you can probably remember, ah yeah, Miss Kelly. Do you know what I mean? And this, that could be, for, for me, it's 30 years ago for yourselves, it's like last week or something. <laughs> Uh, but you'll remember that teacher's name, and you'll remember that teacher's name in 10 years' time. I remember there was a Mrs. Dunphy uh, in my primary school. I don't know what year, Janie. Third class, I think it was. Third, I don't know. I don't know. I have uh, four, maybe fifth class, actually. Fifth class, I think. And she was uh, my primary school teacher, and uh, really helped me with, with music and uh, kind of introduced me to guitar and all, this kind of, all these kind of things, which... Yeah, and she was, she was a demanding teacher. Like, you didn't have your homework done, you stood in the corner. Uh, but I, remember, I always remember what, what she, how she helped me. You know, There were other teachers who didn't, and I don't even remember their names. So when we actually, out of love, in love, this is what we were talking about before, talking about Jesus' authority, when Jesus has a divine authority, right? But the authority isn't just like telling people what to do. That's easy. But he leads the way with love. And so when he tells you what to do, you know that he actually he does so because he cares, like a parent. He, he does so because he cares. He does so because he loves you. And so yes, he can challenge you. Yes, he can have an authority, but you, you don't feel dominated over you. Maybe you feel challenged, but you feel maybe uncomfortable, yes, because maybe what I'm doing isn't right. It's just what I'm doing is where I am. Is, it's, it's not good enough. I, I, I don't pray enough. I don't ask the Lord anything before I make a decision. I don't let him into my life. So maybe, yes, I have to start doing that. That makes me feel a little exposed and vulnerable because now I have to kind of give away control to God and I'm not sure if, if I give control away, if he'll do the things I want him to do because maybe, maybe he won't. Maybe, maybe, maybe I won't be as happy because I won't be doing the things I want to do. I'll be doing the things he wants to do. Here I am, Lord. I come to do your will. Was our psalm. Do I, do I believe that? Do I believe that doing his will, like allowing him to be God in my life, giving him that divine authority in my life, do I believe that this is a good thing? Do I believe this will make me happy? Do I trust him? Do we want to be remembered as, uh, as that teacher, that friend, that catechist, who loved their students, those under their influence, enough to tell them that they can, they can do better, but I'll help you. I'll help you. In the Marines, uh, they, have, they have a tough job. They have to form people to be willing to, willing to die, willing to run into a, run into a battlefield, run into a a hostage situation, whatever it may be, like situations where they're going to have to risk their lives. So they have to be physically fit, but there's something else that they require as well. So we've all seen the movies where there's this obstacle course, like right, they all have to learn to, to get through. And this builds physical strength and resilience. You're climbing uh, 
walls and crawling through mud and you know it's all very physically demanding and that builds up strength and resilience okay but that's all individual then there's, there's a, another course which is called the confidence course which is deliberately built that you cannot overcome these obstacles on your own you can't you can't scale a 12 foot wall on your own you can't right it's just you can't jump it there's no rope you can't but as a team you can and there are often these um high school jocks who are just all built and like want to do this thing on their own and don't want any help or they're standing there at the finish line just kind of jeering at everyone else for being so slow. That's fine for the obstacle course, but they come to the confidence course and they can't do it. You can't do it. And little by little, they, the instructors, they see how these Marines who come in and the first two weeks, all obstacle course, it's all individual, it's all fairly selfish and self-oriented and kind of jeering at each other and booing each other and pushing each other out of the way, whatever it may be. When it comes to the confidence course, they now have to learn to work together. They have to work together or they won't make it. And I think there's something about that as regards our faith too. That the Lord forms us as a family, right? If God's father, our lady's our mother, Jesus is our brother and our the, the church is our home. The Lord has this idea like of community. The Lord himself is community. As a trinity, he's a community. So he does actually want us to work together as different organs in the same body. Different roles, different responsibilities, different gifts, different talents, but all working together. So the Lord is our divine teacher. And sometimes, yes, he will tell us things that are uncomfortable. If we listen to him and learn from him, we will thank him for all eternity for telling us how we can grow, how we can become a saint. We will remember, maybe for all eternity, those who guided us and who had the courage to actually make us feel a bit uncomfortable at times and tell us how and where we need to grow in sanctity. We will remember their names. And we will do this as a, as a community, as a church, as a family, praying with and for each other, because I don't think we can do this on our own. Many of the steps we have to make on our own, but we do have the support of our brothers and sisters praying for us. We're part of a church. So we ask the good Lord today to strengthen each one of us, to help us to recognize also in, in our priest the need to support them, even when they, in the nicest way, with love, when they challenge us to be holier, to be more Christ-centered, we pray for our priests, we pray for the renewal of the priesthood, and we pray for the renewal of our own faith, that we may pray always with our psalmist, here I am, Lord, I come to do your will. <laughs>